Titanic was the world's largest movable object. It was a floating city. This unsinkable ship on its maiden voyage journeys peacefully on the often stormy North Atlantic. It is the sort of night on which you don't think anything's going to go wrong. A weather system brings perfectly calm conditions. Too perfect. The good weather sets the stage for disaster. The Titanic and the iceberg draw closer and closer together. Almost like a zipper. You're opening up seams as if it's going pop, pop, pop. There was this huge cry from roughly 2,200 people as they saw the greatest ship in the world disappear forever. On this episode of When Weather Changed History, the sinking of the Titanic. This is the bride who dies on her wedding night. And from the tragic loss of more than 1,500 lives come sweeping reforms that forever change ocean travel. But in a very real sense, the safety of modern day shipping is because of the lessons learned from Titanic. Cockpit of a C-130, the International Ice Patrol scans the surface of the North Atlantic. From February through July, the IIP's job is to keep a constant vigil to protect ships from a deadly enemy, icebergs. We have good visibility uh, approximately 30 to 33 percent of the time, and so we rely very heavily on radar detecting Sophisticated radar systems use Doppler imaging to help them identify icebergs in the normally foggy conditions. They also rely on what they call the thousand eyes of the International Ice Patrol. Today, and in the early days of the IIP, boat crews search the water for deadly icebergs, and they also rely on iceberg sightings from other ships at sea. Their goal is to protect fellow sailors from collisions like the one that sank the Titanic. The story of the Titanic begins in 1907. As the legend goes, Bruce Ismay of the White Star Line and William Peary of the shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe sit down after a dinner party to talk shop. On a dinner napkin, they sketch ideas for a new class of ocean liners the biggest ever built. Having the largest ships in the world would make the White Star Line master of the North Atlantic, where untold riches could be made ferrying passengers and cargo from Europe to America. The steamship companies were in fierce competition, and they were looking to outdo another. The designs are meant to put White Star a step ahead of its biggest competitor, the Cunard Line. Cunard ships are built for speed, their latest ships hold the records for the fastest Atlantic crossing. In 1906, you have the entry into service of the Lusitania and the Mauritania, the fastest ships in the world by a very large margin. When the Olympic and Titanic was conceived, they decided, well, we probably do not want to compete on the basis of speed, crossing speed, but we'd rather compete on something like uh, size and luxury. Their designs cater to first-class passengers, people who wouldn't mind being at sea for an extra day or so if their surroundings were equal to the finest hotels. People didn't like being vibrated to death in a high-speed vessel. So the fact that Olympic and Titanic were four knots slower than the Lusitania and the Mauritania actually became a selling point. The twin ships, Olympic and Titanic, would be built side by side in the same shipyard in Ireland. In December 1908, construction begins on the Olympic. Three months later, the Titanic shell begins to take form. More than 10,000 men work on the Titanic. Its construction reflects the latest advancements in shipbuilding. Every inch is designed to take on the treacherous Atlantic Ocean. The ships that were built for the North Atlantic were built to withstand the worst weather that uh, the North Atlantic could throw at you. The oceans near freezing water, up to 20-foot swells, 
vicious winds and unpredictable squalls have all been factored into the ship's construction. One of the things they did to build the hulls in order to deal with storms and waves and currents at sea was to strengthen the middle section of the hull. The hull was built from steel plates that were one and a half inches thick. They were six feet wide by 30 feet long, and the, each one of them weighed several tons. The process of holding those plates together was done by riveting. A rivet is basically a double-headed nail, which is heated, then placed through a pre-drilled hole. As the rivet cools, it shrinks, pulling the plates together to form a watertight seal. Inside the hull is a recent innovation, a series of bulkheads. A bulkhead is basically a wall, you could say, that separates sections of the ship. The bulkheads divide the ship into 16 compartments. Titanic is designed to stay afloat, even if two large compartments are damaged. The Titanic boasts other recent technological advances. One is the Marconi Wireless, a radio telegraph, which allows the operators to directly communicate with other ships and land bases. The ship is also wired with electricity, something most homes in 1912 do not have. The Titanic and its sister ship, the Olympic, boast opulent reading rooms, lounges, and dining areas. After the Olympic launches in October 1910, passengers complain that the first and second class accommodations are too cramped. Shipbuilders scramble to redesign the Titanic. First class passenger rooms are enlarged. Windows are fitted along the first class deck to keep the wind and spray away. With all the attention to detail, one decision wasn't given a second thought. The British Board of Trade requires that a large ship weighing more than 10,000 tons must have a minimum of 16 lifeboats. The Titanic had the 16 required lifeboats, plus four extra collapsible ones. Combined, they could hold roughly 1,200 people. The ship could carry over 3,000. Yet the limited number of lifeboats simply wasn't a concern. Of course, the reason for that was the ship was considered to be, quote, unsinkable. It is April 1st, 1912, and the Titanic is ready to begin its sea trials. The trials are a period where the ship is taken out and put through its paces. But high winds keep the huge ship, which towers about 60 feet above the water, in port. Because Titanic was so high out of the water, there was a possibility that it could potentially expose the ship to some handling problems. The next day, the winds subside, and the crew puts the Titanic through its paces. For 12 hours, they check the ship's maneuverability. The crew then performs the emergency stop test. Speeding at 20 knots, or 23 miles per hour, the ship takes 850 yards, just under a half mile to come to a complete halt. The Titanic passes with flying colors. April 10th, 1912, the port of Southampton, England. The Titanic prepares for its maiden voyage to New York. At the time of its launch, the Titanic was the world's largest movable object, slightly larger than its sister ship, the Olympic. While the Titanic waits, another ocean traveler, an iceberg, is following the current from its home in Greenland. One way to think of Greenland is that it's a giant bowl of ice. Thousands upon thousands, 10,000 or more icebergs formed each year off of Greenland. One iceberg is making an historic voyage of its own. Even while the Titanic was rising in its berth, the mountain of ice was headed toward the unsinkable ship. Spring 1912, the North Atlantic. An iceberg that formed nearly three years ago in Greenland 
makes its way south. On the cool and breezy morning of April 10th, Captain E.J. Smith and crew report for duty on the Titanic in Southampton, England. Titanic is the largest ship in the world and touted in the press as unsinkable. More than 1,800 passengers and crew board for its historic maiden voyage to New York. On board, passengers are escorted to their different quarters. There was a definite class system in operation in the early 1900s. Each class has its own sleeping quarters, common areas, dining rooms, and deck space. The lowest class is third, known on other ships as steerage. Among the third class passengers is an 18-year-old Finnish woman named Anna Turia. Grandma was one of 21 children of one father, two mothers. She was out of the house working by the time she was nine. Her half-sister had sent Anna a ticket to come to America to work in her store in Ashtabula, Ohio. So at 18 years old, she's heading out far from the home she knew and heading to America on the Titanic. When she first got on the ship, it was just grand and glorious. It was, it was a city, a beautiful city, and more magnificent than what she'd ever seen. It had everything you could want. For many third-class passengers, the Titanic offered luxuries they'd never known. These people had little, if anything, in the old country. So it was truly an amazing voyage for these people. Many second-class passengers are professional people going to America. Among them is 19-year-old William Mellers. He was very tall, six foot two, very athletic, very trim. Some of the younger girls in second class, in their memoirs, it's almost like a little crush they had on him. And they mentioned Willie, they called him. Willie chronicles his journey in letters to his family. We're having glorious weather and the sun is shining most magnificently. Everything is so grand that I cannot express my feelings in words. I'm having plenty to eat and have only to press a button and up comes a steward ready to do anything I wish. The first class passenger list reads like a who's who of the rich and famous. They'd wintered in Europe and they were coming back to the United States for the social season. One of the richest men in the world. John Jacob Astor and his new wife Madeline are aboard. She's expecting the couple's first child and wants to be home for the delivery. Also aboard are the co-owners of Macy's Department Store, Isidore and Ida Strauss. The first class people had uh, opulence you just can't envision. The money they had was their money to be spent as they wished. The Titanic leaves Southampton at noon as a crowd of 100,000 onlookers cheer. Contrary to many people's belief, the Titanic was never christened. To use the words of one of the shipyard workers, they just builds them and pushes them in when it came to the White Star Line ships. The voyage to America begins in England and makes two stops. We are on our way to Cherbourg in France, and we expect to reach Queenstown about 10 o'clock Thursday. More passengers board at each port, bringing the total number to a little over 2,200. On the afternoon of April 11th, 1912, the Titanic sets off across the ocean for New York. The massive vessel takes its place in the shipping lanes. These specific routes were created to steer ships away from the danger of icebergs. Trying to track icebergs is trying to understand the currents of the ocean because they're the dominant factor in the movement of the icebergs. There are many currents in the ocean which carry floating objects like an iceberg. 
One of them is the Labrador Current, which flows south from Greenland, along the coast of Newfoundland. Icebergs drift along this current, which brings them directly into the path of North Atlantic ships. To protect ships from colliding with icebergs, the shipping lanes steer vessels through warmer water. But in 1912, stronger than normal north-northwest winds helped the cold Labrador current push further south. In 1912, the Labrador current was particularly strong and actually dominated the region. We know that ice was seen much further south than was it ever seen before. The majority of icebergs never make it to the shipping lanes. If you make a rough estimate on how much of the ice makes it to the shipping lanes, uh, it's probably less than 1%. But one iceberg, a fraction of 1%, is now on a collision course with the Titanic. During the first few days of April, over 20 reports of ice are broadcast from ships in the area, five on April 10th alone. Just after leaving Europe, the first inklings of danger come across the Titanic's telegraph. As the ship was heading westward, the Marconi wireless operators on board Titanic began receiving a series of ice warnings. Captain Smith is a 40-year veteran of the sea, but he has never personally faced a crisis on the open ocean. The Titanic was following standard operating procedures of other steamships on the North Atlantic. Go at full speed, trust your lookouts to spot an iceberg, take course changes if you needed to, and, and basically hope for the best. Titanic's course of action will not be enough. Soon, the convergence of good weather and ice that's unusually far south will equal disaster. On the open sea, Captain Smith increases the Titanic speed to 22 knots. Lookouts high atop the crow's nest scan the waters for icebergs. For three days of the voyage, the weather is nearly perfect, with temperatures close to 50 degrees during the day and only a few passing showers. On the fourth day, April 14th, Titanic passes through a cold front. By 8 p.m., the temperature drops to 33 degrees. As the cold descended, something else descended, and that was the, the nature of the ocean itself. It became as flat as a lake, no swell, mirror glass flat. The Titanic sails into a high pressure system where the air sinks near its center, creating a cloudless sky with no winds. It is what sailors call an oily calm. The surface of the water gets perfectly still, as in a bathtub. It is also a moonless night. The only light they have is from the stars. The Titanic has received at least four warnings of ice in the shipping lanes. The captain alerts the crew to keep a close watch. Up in the crow's nest, the lookouts know that the best way to spot an iceberg at night is to look and listen for waves crashing at its base. But there are no waves and no warning signs. 11 p.m. The Titanic's wireless telegraph operator is racing to get through a backlog of messages. 20 miles ahead, the freighter Californian is stopped in an ice field. The captain tells his wireless operator to inform the Titanic about the ice. But the operator doesn't begin his message with the code MSG. Which would have said we have a message of high importance. They just broke in with a simple, casual, say, oh man, did, did you know we stopped because of ice? The Titanic's operator dismisses the message from the Californian about ice ahead. The final ice warning is ignored. The operator on the Californian waits for further response from the Titanic. When he gets no reply, he goes to bed. The Titanic races ahead, 
The lookouts continue to scan the ocean for trouble. Iceberg straight ahead! At 11.40 p.m., one of them sees something. The warning reaches the bridge. Iceberg straight ahead! The first officer attempts to turn the ship. Hard to starboard! In its sea trials, it took Titanic nearly a half mile to come to a full stop. The iceberg is barely a quarter mile ahead. There is not enough time to stop. For the next 37 seconds, they watch and wait as the Titanic and the iceberg draw closer and closer together. In the space of perhaps 15 to 20 seconds, the iceberg does its damage and mortally wounds the Titanic. Captain Smith rushes to the bridge to assess the damage. The Titanic has been breached in five watertight compartments. It was built to stay afloat with two compartments breached, but not five. The unsinkable ship is sinking. April 14th, 1912, 11.40 p.m. The unsinkable Titanic has just collided with an iceberg in the freezing North Atlantic. Captain Smith orders the distress call, CQD, come quick, danger. The Titanic's distress calls reach the passenger ship Carpathia, 58 miles southeast. The captain orders his crew to turn about. He immediately did a U-turn in the Atlantic and basically began charging for the distress position that Titanic was sending out. But because of limited navigation equipment in 1912, the coordinates given in the distress call are 13 miles off target. It has celestial navigation. And so generally they got that at sunset. They got their fix. Now, they wouldn't get another fix till the next morning. So they were doing what were called dead reckoning. They would just guess that, well, I'll probably be here by next morning. Well, there was never a next morning. The freighter Californian is less than 15 miles away, but the wireless operator aboard has already gone to bed. Titanic's call for help goes unheard by the ship that was close enough to help. Captain Smith orders his crew to launch the lifeboats. Many of the passengers are unaware that the ship is in trouble. Third class passenger Anna Turia barely notices the collision until there is a knock on Anna's door. The brother of one of her roommates came pounding on the door, get up, get up. Put on some warm clothes and come out, or you'll find yourself at the bottom of the ocean. Anna and her roommates decide to go on deck. The band is playing, and the mood on deck is calm. Some passengers think this is just a drill. They do not believe the ship will sink. Some felt it was safer and warmer to stay aboard this modern marvel than be launched into the freezing cold of one of the 16 rigid or four collapsible lifeboats. The Titanic is supposedly unsinkable, so, you know, everything's well in hand. This is a technological marvel, so I'm safe on board this great ship. Some go back inside, worried about the cold. Anna Turia is one of them. She commented on the weather that night as being very, very cold. They went back to their room to get extra clothes to stay warm. There are also issues of class. First and second class women and children have first priority in the lifeboats. People in third class knew that they had to wait for the first and second class to be taken care of on the boat deck. John Astor helps his pregnant wife into a lifeboat then steps back into the crowd. Ida Strauss refuses to leave her husband. She tells a crewman, we live together, we'll die together. 
Passenger William Mellers would later recount the last hours of the Titanic. I soon dressed and got up on deck to find crowds up there putting on lifeboats. The first lifeboats launched are less than half full. One lifeboat only has 12 people in it. It could hold 40. But after a while, things begin to change. 1.15 a.m., roughly two hours after the collision, the ship is starting to list. Passengers now understand the ship really is sinking. They clamber to the deck, trying to get a seat on the last of the lifeboats. Anatoya is waiting there with her friends. She was hesitant to get in one of the boats. She didn't know the severity of what was happening. But a crewman picks her up and puts her in boat number 15. At roughly 2 a.m., the last of the 16 lifeboats drops into the frigid Atlantic waters, estimated to be around 30 degrees. It was an awful sight to see the men's faces when the last boat went off. We were trying to fix up a collapsible boat when she gave the first signs of going under. People in the lifeboats look back in horror. They can hear passengers screaming as the Titanic begins to go under. As the final waves were coming over the boat deck, people started coming up from below. They looked like ants just coming up onto the deck. Men, women, children. Too late. The boats were all gone, and the waves were slowly taking the Titanic underwater. There seemed to be mountains of water rushing through the doors, and I was swept away from where I was. There was suddenly an explosion, and I found myself whizzing through the water at an awful pace, having been blown away by the explosion. When the steam was, was let loose from below, it was blown through the air. Mellers crashes into the water next to one of the collapsible lifeboats. The freezing water is excruciating. The second officer said that when he struck the water, it was as if a thousand knives had been thrust into his body simultaneously. If you could keep out of the water, there's a chance you could stay alive a little longer. William Mellers and a few other passengers pull themselves out of the water onto an overturned collapsible boat. After a time, I saw some of the people gradually dropping down dead, one at the time, and we had to push their bodies off to keep the raft afloat. A lot of people died, not from drowning, not from going down with the ship, but freezing to death. On April 15th at 2.20 a.m., Titanic slips below the icy waters of the North Atlantic. After she had gone, the sight that met one's eyes was terrible. There were great masses of wreckage with hundreds of human beings fighting amongst hundreds of dead bodies for their lives. The cries of the dying carry over the cold water to the lifeboats. Anatoria is tortured by the sounds. The memory that haunted her the most of the whole night was the voices in the night, the screams of the hundreds and hundreds of people in the water crying for help. Some survivors row their lifeboats back to the wreckage and pull people from the water. Others do not, afraid that their boats will be overturned by survivors trying to climb in. People in the frigid water die quickly, as the minutes turn to hours, the cold air takes its toll on those on the boats. The coldness very quickly permeates every aspect of the people in the lifeboats. The survivors are lucky that the ocean remains as smooth as glass. For Anatoria, whose lifeboat is packed with people, the calm water is key to her survival. She commented that resting her hand on the side of the boat, her fingers were even getting wet. It was that low in the water. If there had been waves, Anna would probably not have been a survivor. The roughly 700 survivors wait for help to come. 
The Carpathia steams toward the coordinates supplied by the Titanic's distress call, which are 13 miles off course. The miracle is that in heading for that wrong position, he actually stumbles into the area where Titanic's lifeboats are. At 3 a.m., the crew of the Carpathia begins to launch rockets off the bow as a signal to survivors that help is on its way. In lifeboat number two, an officer sets off green flares in hopes of signaling his ship. The crew of the Carpathia spots the green light 300 yards ahead. For the survivors, rescue is within sight. At roughly 4 o'clock in the morning, April 15, 1912, nearly two hours after Titanic sank, the crew of the passenger ship Carpathia spots the scattered lifeboats in the water. The rescue comes in the nick of time. The calm, high-pressure system is moving out, with a windy, low-pressure system taking its place. The freezing, oily calm is changing to cold, choppy seas. The cold was very, very bad. And as morning started to arrive, a distinct chop started to arrive with it. You could actually hear waves lapping on the bottom of the boat. During the next four hours, the Carpathia takes aboard more than 700 survivors from the icy Atlantic. As the Carpathia rushes to New York, stories of Titanic's fate begin to make headlines around the world. As the initial shock subsides, questions about the tragedy begin to surface. Newspapers question who or what is to blame. Within a month, the U.S. and Great Britain launch investigations. The main thing was to capture people's impressions and reactions while they were still very fresh. Witnesses are questioned about every aspect of the voyage, including the weather conditions. Both British and American investigators agree there must be additional legislation to secure safety of life at sea. In particular, they note a critical lack of lifeboats, even though the Titanic had the minimum required by law. Among the recommendations was that uh, no ship be allowed to leave a U.S. port with insufficient lifeboats. Lifeboat drills would be required. It also beefed up the inspection of ships to make sure that life belts and, and uh, lifeboats were in ample supply. The inquiries also agree that strict guidelines are needed for the transmission of critical information. As a result, all ships are advised to carry enough wireless operators to man the telegraph 24 hours a day. One of the outgrowths of the Titanic disaster is the establishment of the Federal Radio Commission in the U.S. in 1912, which later becomes the Federal Communications Commission. Both inquiries questioned what role the crew played in the disaster and acknowledged that the weather was a factor. In their report, American investigators noted how an officer recalled being told by the captain that, quote, if it was hazy, we should have to go very slowly. By the time the Titanic struck the iceberg, there was no wind, there was no sea. It was perfectly calm, perfectly clear. Because there was no haze, the ship maintained its speed. That, combined with the ignored ice warnings, contributed to the disaster. In Britain's final report, the cause is quite simple. The loss of the said ship was due to collision with an iceberg. For the next 73 years, Titanic's allure compels explorers to search for her wreckage. In September of 1985, the search finally ends. Two and a half miles below the water, Robert Ballard and his team find the prize. Naturally, our initial reaction was you know, scoring the winning goal at the buzzer. So there was a huge outburst of, of pent-up emotional energy and yelling and screaming and really celebrating. We were embarrassed that we were celebrating because we realized we were at the spot 
where so many people had lost their lives. Ballard and his team explore the rusting hull and find reminders of the men and women who went down with the ship. What's always left behind are their shoes, because the shoes have been treated with tannic acid when you make leather, and the animals of the deep sea will not eat leather. Ballard's discovery sheds light on Titanic's final moments. She didn't sink intact. If the ship sank intact, there's just a ship down there. But if the ship broke in half, then it would act like a giant salt shaker and it would dump into the ocean thousands and thousands and thousands of objects. In the debris field are pieces of china, a basin and a metal bathtub, all preserved for decades on the cold, dark ocean floor. The underwater weather, known as currents, affects the condition of the ship. You find greater and greater preservation the deeper and deeper you go into the ship. A whole other weather pattern sets in. And that's because as you get inside the Titanic, there's no circulation and it, there's no oxygen. Titanic's exterior shows the most decay. Wood boring mollusks are devouring the deck and the hull is also being transformed by bacteria. During subsequent missions, pieces of the ship's hull are raised for study. Forensic metals expert Jennifer McCarty hopes to uncover why the Titanic failed. One question is often asked, how can ice crush steel? So what I looked at was studying the wrought iron to try to understand what made Titanic material good or bad and what role the material played in the sinking. For years, people believed that the result of the collision of the ship with the iceberg was this 300-foot-long gash along the starboard side. Instead of one large gash created by weak metal, researchers actually find a series of small openings. It's stretched out over five watertight compartments. So the average opening is three quarters of an inch. To explain what caused the tears, McCarty examines the rivets that held the plates together and find something astonishing. The material used to make the rivets was one grade lower and weaker than what was normally used in shipbuilding. When pressure between the Titanic's hull and the iceberg caused a weak rivet to break, it created more pressure on the remaining rivets. And then you get heads popping and almost like a zipper. You're opening up seams as if it's going pop, pop, pop. McCarty examined engineering records from the shipyard. She determined that the shipbuilders approved the use of substandard iron, even though they were calling the ship unsinkable. Images of Titanic's wreckage are a warning that the dangers of the North Atlantic still exist. But now, there is help to navigate the icy ocean. One of the major differences between 1912 and 2008 is the existence of the International Ice Patrol. The tragic sinking of the Titanic in 1912 begins a series of sweeping changes for every ship at sea. The most important outcome of the inquiries is the formation of the International Ice Patrol, or IIP, which is a unit of the U.S. Coast Guard. Our ship was carrying out the routine duties of the International Ice Patrol. Through the 1930s, ships patrolled the Atlantic for ice. In the 1940s, long-range airplanes joined the patrol. In the 1980s, the advent of radar enables pilots to track icebergs through fog and bad weather. And the IIP continues to explore new ways to monitor the ocean. The modern uh, satellite technology has allowed us to put very sophisticated radars into space. And we're working very hard right now to use that information to detect icebergs in the North Atlantic. The amount of ice they see greatly varies year to year. 
1984, over 2,200 icebergs uh, moved into the shipping lanes, creating a tremendously dangerous uh, situation. In 2006, no icebergs passed into the shipping lanes. The weather both above and below the water has a significant effect on the number of icebergs they see. I believe that the variability is mostly to do with the oceanographic and the meteorological conditions the icebergs experience in their trip into the shipping lanes. Since the sinking of the Titanic, deaths associated with iceberg collisions have decreased because of the IIP. More than 1,500 people lost their lives on one magnificent ship, but over 700 survived to tell their stories. Millionaires John Astor and Isidore and Ida Strauss died in the tragedy. Astor's wife, Madeline, survived and gave birth to a son. William Mellers became the editor of the magazine National Republic, shining a spotlight on un-American activities in the United States. Anaturia settled in Ashtabula, Ohio, and got married. She recounted the tale of the Titanic to her children each April 14th. Nearly a century later, Titanic's wreckage continues to attract scientists and spectators. And until the sea claims the last piece of debris, there will always be a story to tell. The amazing part about Titanic is that nearly 100 years after it sank, new things are still being learned. The end of the story has not been told. <laughs>